All right, Todd Furman, BetTheBoardPodcast.com and OutKick on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. What is up, Furman? How are you? I'm doing very well this afternoon, gentlemen. How are you boys doing? Doing fantastic. At Todd Furman is where you follow him on Twitter, the former odds maker there at Caesars Palace, always kind with his time with us. I saw earlier tweets that the the betting on Tiger Woods right now in the Masters, a guy who has not played in forever, it seems, is out of control in Vegas. Is that a good way of describing it? I don't know if out of control is even strong enough right now. It's almost as though people are acting like drunken sailors thinking that they have to get a piece of tiger at some of these ridiculous odds that are out there, <laughs> not realizing that they're still not getting anything, getting anything close to fair market value. And while Tiger obviously teeing it up always gives him more than a puncher's chance uh, at Augusta, a course that's essentially his own, that he's owned for so many years, you have to obviously go into this situation without uh, real – with realistic expectations, knowing that he hasn't played competitive golf in quite some time. And it's not just the striking of the golf ball that could be challenging, but walking the undulations and trying to compete for 72 holes, I feel like is a massive leap of faith. Yeah, Furman, I don't know what your strategy is when people ask you about handicapping golf on these majors. Um, You know, an example is we do a pool and we get to pick four golfers and it's hard to pick out of four one that's going to win it. So I tell people, you know, these 15 to 20 to ones, those are tough. I like the match play once we see those daily matchups. How do you typically tell people to play golf in these majors? Yeah, most professional bettors will go to the matchups, and that's where they'll do a lion's share of their damage, whether it's the four-round matchups for the entire tournament or they'll look to try and take advantage, you know, each and individual round. I can tell you one of the things that I've seen as far as tomorrow is concerned from a matchup standpoint is professional bettors laid a dollar thirty-five up to a dollar seventy-five with Tony Finau against the aforementioned Tiger Woods. And while Tony Finau's current form doesn't leave you a lot to be excited about, you look at how he's played at Augusta, clearly this is a course where he feels extremely comfortable, and there's some skepticism from professionals regarding Tiger and his ability to compete, a far cry from recreational bettors who want to make their $20 and $50 bets on Tiger to win the whole tournament. If you're looking to try and bet outright, and it's whether it's your first foray into betting golf or you've done this before, you have to kind of build out that portfolio. You want to try and find a couple of favorites that you like where you're going to have slightly bigger bets you'll find some of those value picks in the middle of the field and while Augusta hasn't lent itself to long shots coming home to roost in the past uh, I can tell you that a lot of people are gravitating towards a player like Mark Leishman thinking that he should be able to navigate through the wind and the elements maybe more effectively than some of the U.S. born golfers Uh, we have a lot of Justin Thomas fans around here Uh, uh, he's he's in a sweet spot this is his seventh Masters what do you think of Justin's chances uh, this week You know, the numbers come down on JT. There's no doubt he's attracted quite a bit of interest uh, in the betting markets. His price, 16-1 to when numbers were first posted. He's currently the second favorite behind only John Rahm. And when you look at some of JT's matchups, you have seen him take money against Cameron Smith and against Scotty Scheffler as well. The 12-1 to price, probably a bit of a deterrent for me. I need to see him navigate through these greens more. And I know with Bones McKeon on his bag, everyone is optimistic that the putting that has kind of left him high and dry in the past should be rectified. But I want to see him put together, you know, a full four rounds in this tournament. He put so much pressure on himself to win this particular major. I just don't see enough at 12 to 1 to get me that excited. But he's not a guy that I'd be looking to fade in his head to head matchups either. All right, before we move on to opening day in baseball, a favorite that you kind of like at Augusta and a dark horse you kind of like at Augusta? You know, I feel I do this every year, guys, and I bet the same golfer, and he does nothing but cost me money, and I'll probably do it until he finally breaks through and wins that elusive first green jacket. That would be Patrick Cantlay at 25-1. to His skill set sets up well here. I know he's had a kind of a mixed bag of results, but if you look at some of the comparable courses, I mean, Cantlay has done extremely well uh, in the past, and I really believe his time is coming, and if you get him at these kind of prices – uh, it's going to pay dividends somewhere along the way. Uh, Brooks Kepka would be another one that I would throw in that same bucket as well. This will be the healthiest Brooks has been, you know, kind of coming into things. And if you're looking further down the odds board, uh, I'm actually a lot more bullish than the market is on Daniel Berger. I know he's got boomer bust potential, uh, but I feel Berger's skill set sets up extremely well for this course. Nobody has talked about him coming in. Uh, and at 50 to 1, he's a guy that I'll have something on in my portfolio as well. Okay, Major League Baseball opens tomorrow night. Win totals. Uh, my Dodgers, it opened at 96. Six and a half. It's up to 98 and a half. That's a heavy number of Major League Baseball. But if you look at the last five seasons, four of those seasons, if we include the abbreviated 2020 season, that would have gone over the 100 wins. You know, when you look at this roster, best lineup in baseball, you know, the 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 rotation is going to be good, maybe not great. 
But 90 and a, 98 and a half, do you have any problem playing the over here? The thing with the Dodgers and the reason that win total has gone up is because the rest division is downright garbage uh, in most facets of the game. When you look at the San Diego Padres, this is a team I know that's done a little bit to bolster their rotation, but let's see if they can live up to expectations. The Rockies have done quite a bit to try and help with their bats. I actually like bringing Chris Bryant into that ballpark along with Randall Grinchick, but pitching-wise, they're going to struggle. The Diamondbacks will as well. When you talk about the Dodgers, LT, my biggest concern for this team is I don't like their bullpen nearly as much as some folks do. I think one through three, if Clayton Kershaw stays healthy, they're going to be dynamic, and I really believe Julio Urias will continue to take the next step and is a little bit of a dark horse to win the Cy Young. But when you go out and acquire Craig Kimbrell, and he's the guy that you're trusting to pitch the ninth inning, I'm not sure how long that sticks. I ultimately believe Blake Trennan can take over in that role, uh, but I wouldn't go under on the Dodgers. I just don't know if I want to go over a number that's a touch high. I watch a lot of uh, American League baseball because I'm a Tampa Bay Rays fan, and until Tampa Bay plays them, I forget sometimes there are franchises in Seattle, in Detroit, but everybody's telling me that those two franchises are on the upswing. Do you buy that the, the Mariners and Tigers may be having a sort of a bounce back year this year? The Tigers are going to be a fun team to watch. They have an infusion of young talent that I think can pay dividends. When you look at guys uh, like Spencer Torkelson, who's going to make the big league roster, he'll hit at the bottom uh, of the lineup. I'm not as big a fan of Javier Baez as a lot of people are. I mean, I think even in this modern-day game where you don't really care as much about strikeouts, he's a huge liability. Hitting in the middle of the lineup, Miguel Cabrera in the twilight of his career as well. And Austin Meadows, uh, I think it's an interesting move acquiring him from the Rays, but I'm always concerned when Tampa is more than willing to part ways with a player, uh, expecting that he's going to have you know upside elsewhere. So with Detroit at 78 and a half, that's widely available. My lean would be under the total for the Tigers. Uh, I think this rotation is a little bit too young, and that's where there's some concerns in a central division that I think will actually be a little bit better than people believe. As far as the Mariners, you know, this is a team that I find fascinating because they were extremely lucky last year. And when you look at their win-loss record and you dig into some of their metrics, it didn't suggest they should have won nearly as many games as they should have. They went out there and they got Robbie Ray to kind of be the ace of the staff, albeit paying a premium uh, in the wake of his resurgent performance last year uh, with Toronto. It's a young lineup that I think has upside and a division that leaves a lot to be desired, but I have to go under just on the metrics. Uh, I have the Mariners more so as a 500 team, and I think that's their ceiling. Uh, I'm happy to go under 84 and a half with Seattle. Todd Furman on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. The Universal DH, uh, it's really more about the National League, does what in Vegas to National League baseball that can legally be bet on? You know, it's a great question, and I think we're going to see how odds makers are going to adjust some of their over-unders, how managers elect to be a little bit different with their strategy, because obviously the double switch comes out of the equation. You don't have to pull a starter nearly as fast if you believe his bat is going to end a rally in the middle of the game once these pitchers start to get stretched out. So I think you're going to see totals in the National League resemble a little bit more like their AL brethren, where typically over the years you were seeing a half run less in a lot of the games that had comparable pitching matchups just because you didn't have that assumed out at the bottom of the lineup. So let's see what odds makers uh, elect to do. It'll be fascinating to see how these National League managers adjust to that unique nuance, especially those that haven't had to deal with it other than an interleague play and, of course, the World Series when it bears its head. Okay, two, uh, two Braves questions. One, obviously big trade getting rid of Freddie Freeman. Who has more home runs this year, Freeman with the Dodgers or Olsen now with the Atlanta Braves? You know, I'll take Matt Olson there. I mean, he would be an underdog in this particular proposition. I think Freeman's run production will be better, but when you're talking about two very different hitter environments, obviously Truist Park is going to be a little bit more favorable for Matt Olson, especially coming over from Oakland where you lose an awful lot of outs in fall territory, and when you're hitting into that marine layer for a lot of those late starts, it knocks some balls down. So I think Olson will benefit immensely. Uh, and I have to give the Braves credit. It's not easy in the wake of winning a World Series when you part – with the face of the franchise, uh, but I think they made the prudent move here. Olsen's a little bit younger. He's a little bit better defensively, and the fact they're going to plug him in most likely in that three-hole I think speaks dividends about the Braves' staying power when you look at the strength of this team, which is a young pitching rotation, assuming all of those guys return to form, uh, and Charlie Morton shows no ill effect of that broken leg that he suffered late last season. Okay, we, we know the Dodgers are good. That's on the National League side. Just to win the division, I'm being told that the Phillies and Mets are supposed to be good. Would you take the Braves to at least win their division? Uh, you know, when you look at the National League East, uh, I think this division is significantly better from top to bottom than what we've seen in the past. And as far as pricing is concerned, 
Uh, we've seen money come in against the Mets, obviously, in the wake of the Jacob DeGrom injury. That's changed the look of their rotation. Uh, I think a lot of Mets fans probably, if you gave them 100 bucks to name their opening day starter, wouldn't guess Tyler McGill was going to be that guy if we asked a couple of weeks ago. So the Braves at a shade better than even money, I think, make uh, a little bit of sense there. Uh, but it's a division I want to see play out. If I could get Atlanta in that plus $2 range if they started slow with a World Series hangover or such, would make a little more sense. I'm not necessarily buying the Phillies, and the reason for that is I think that their bullpen is going to be a real challenge. So cobbling together those final nine outs on a nightly basis could be a challenge. But as far as uh, other teams that could surprise, I think the Marlins, if you can find them at 4-1 to one to make the playoffs, in my opinion, this team has the best pitching staff uh, in that division. And if you're talking about Miami still trying to figure out ways to manufacture runs, they've made small moves this offseason. I don't think they're going to blow anybody away with their offensive capabilities. Uh, but that's a staff, if they stay healthy, that can be scary good. And I think Sandy Alcantara has every bit the pieces to potentially win the Cy Young maybe as soon as this season. Wow. In the chat room, LT's neighbor says, Furman either has a photographic memory or studies nonstop. Which is it, Todd? Studies nonstop. <laughs> I wish it was the first part because it would make my life a hell of a lot easier and give me a lot more free time. But uh, it's all about diving into these things and constantly pounding the pavement to try and do it. Uh, I won't claim to bet baseball on a day-in, day-out basis. I'll do some digging into the futures markets as much as anything else or golf. Um, but we don't talk a lot of hockey here, so all the time I put in there uh, watching hockey on a nightly basis doesn't always pay dividends. More likely Panthers or Hurricanes to win the, to win the Cup? You know, I think the Hurricanes are, are better built for playoff hockey. I mean, they're more than happy to play lower-scoring games. I still have some questions about Freddie Anderson, though. Uh, given all of those playoff demons he'll have to exercise from his time in Toronto. And as someone who bet the Panthers before the season at long shot odds, uh, I'm not going to abandon my day to the dance. But I think in the playoffs, not having Joel Quenville on the bench is where it'll ultimately cost that team. And you really can't expect to erase four goal deficits on a nightly basis like we've seen from them twice in the last four days. Do you know, that that do you, shows do you that's not uh, no. uh, that he's. Uh, we would have never asked that question. That's, no. that's a great. That's a great <laughs> yeah. homework. He doesn't come to this interview ready to talk hockey. No. Um, <laughs> do you know more about this or cryptocurrency? Uh, you know what? Uh, the reality of it is, and LT might understand this better than you guys, I got into the crypto racket probably back in 2016 because of sports betting. We used to do work with offshore books, and that was the only way that you could really transfer funds consistently. So I, I learned a lot more about Bitcoin and Ethereum back then than I ever wanted to, and uh, we'll call that a fortuitous bounce that I held some of my stock in both of those cryptos at market rates significantly lower than what they trade at right now. Very nice. My fear is always cryptocurrency. When it actually shows up to me, it's got Putin's face on it. <laughs> can you use crypto at Chick-fil-A yet? Uh, you know what? I don't know if you can use it at Chick-fil-A. I know you can use it at Starbucks, uh, but at the same time, I think you're better off probably putting it aside for a rainy day, realizing that it's got boomer bust potential. And if it goes to zero, you're okay with the loss. But at the same time, the way the economy is trending in five to 10 years, that may have a lot more spending power than the American dollar. <laughs> Every time we bring up Bitcoin, Lance says, I don't know what's wrong with the money we got right now. <laughs> I do. I like, I like the old paper bill. I yeah. like the U.S. dollar. Yeah, you like the old guy here who thinks the actual Bitcoin's coming with somebody's face yeah, on it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that, that they actually have a hard Bitcoin. Money. Yes. Uh, Furman, thank you for the time, buddy. Enjoy the Masters. Enjoy the baseball. We'll see you again. You got it. Hey, one last thing, yeah. guys, too. As far as baseball futures, I did make an MVP bet. I think this number is still widely available for the American League. I took a flyer with Byron Buxton at 35-1. to 1. I think when you look at the spring he's put together and some of his measurables, I mean, this is a guy as a 5 tool player we've waited for an eternity. Obviously, health hasn't worked in his favor, but I really believe Buxton can be a guy that can take the world by storm and maybe a guy that some fantasy managers want to target early in the season before his price goes through the roof. I, I will tell you, I went from 40-1 to 1 to 10-1. to 1. Just oh, now, as you said, that. Furman, Furman, moved <laughs> Furman moved No, it. this is in the last couple of weeks, it's going from 40. I mean, he's crushing it right now in spring. Yeah, that's the one thing. I mean, that's always tricky, LT, because obviously spring doesn't necessarily translate. But you look into what Buxton has done and you kind of extrapolate his numbers out. It's a little bit scary because he's found ways with soft tissue issues and a variety of other things. But if this guy plays 130 to 140 games, I really believe it could be between him and Shohei Otani for AL, AL supremacy there this wow. year. Wow. All right, there's a free play from Furman. Thank you, Furman. Have a great week. You got it, gentlemen. Best of luck with all your Masters picks and bets this weekend. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Take care. That is Todd Furman with us on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. 